Working with unseen poetry can often seem like a daunting task, trying to come up with an interpretation of a poem without being able to do any research on the poem or the poet can feel a little overwhelming. This presentation will talk about how we can use our reading of the poem to build up an interpretation, starting from very practical, straightforward observations and working towards more abstract ideas about theme and tone. So what can we find out about a poem before we read it? If we look at the poem on the page, we will see the author's name and a title and possibly a date of publication. This might give us useful clues. We might know the author. We might know another poem by him or her. The title might suggest the theme or the tone that the poem is going to take. And so we should look for the clues that the author gives us with that. And the date will also allow us to think about comparable poems. It might be significant historically. Just by looking at the poem on the page, we will be able to see if the lines are regular, if they're more or less the same length or not. We can also see whether the poem is broken up into stanzas, how many stanzas there are and how many lines are in each stanza. There may be unequal numbers of lines. They may all have the same number of lines. There may also be a refrain repeated at the end of each stanza. This is more common in earlier poetry. And we can also tell how many lines there are in the poem before we even read it. So there's a lot of practical information there that we can glean before we've actually read the words. We should note these things down and they will help us build up our overall picture of the poem. Now we need to read the poem more carefully and I would suggest that we do this three times, looking for slightly different things on each reading. On the first reading, again, look for practical, straightforward things. As we read through the poem, can we spot if there is a regular rhythm? Short lines with a regular rhythm tend to have a kind of bouncy feel. Longer lines with four or five beats tend to be smoother and they have a gentler and often a more elevated tone. We can also tell on a first reading if there's a regular rhyme scheme. We just look at the end rhymes. And we should remember that some set verse forms have regular rhyme schemes. So 14 lines with the regular rhyme scheme, we may be dealing with a sonnet. On a first reading, we can also see where the punctuation is. End stop lines, where the punctuation comes at the end of each line, creates a more regular rhythm than run on lines or sejour, where we have punctuation in the middle of the line. We can also see who is telling the poem, whether we have a first person narrator, an I, or if the poem is describing something that happened to somebody else, a third person. If there is a first person I in the poem, we should ask ourselves how far we're invited to think of this I as being like the poet. Sometimes poets will voice different kinds of voices, perhaps even a male poet writing in the voice of a woman. If the poetic persona is different to the poet, we might want to note the hints that we get as to how that is. And we should also note whether or not there is more than one speaker in the poem. It may be a dialogue. On a second reading, we can start to expand a little and think about the overall ideas that the poem is presenting. We can think about whether or not the action of the poem is set in a particular place. Is the poem supposedly happening at a particular time or on a particular occasion? Are we clearly told that there is a place where the action of the poem is happening? Or is there an event that is being retold in the poem? Not all poems have such an obvious setting and where it's lacking, we should ask ourselves what the poet is doing instead. Is he describing an interior feeling rather than an event? Is the poet being deliberately cryptic? Does she want to hide from us the kind of event she's talking about or the kind of time that she's talking about? until perhaps later in the poem. We can look for more information on how the setting or the event of the poem is described by concentrating on adjectives and adverbs, the describing words in the poem. We can also think about narrative. Is there a story to the poem? Is there a progression in the conversation? Is there a series of events? Does something begin and reach its conclusion? And looking at the verbs is a good way for us to think about narrative. Is it all in the past tense or does it move between past and present 
or between present and future tenses. On our third reading, we're in a better position to think about what the poem means overall. And we can do this by looking at the way that the overall feel of the poem is consistent. Are the observations we've made consistent with each other? Is the event or the setting consistent with the language used to describe it? If this is a poem set at midnight, is the language associated with darkness or is the language associated with light which would be odd and contrasting do we have perhaps a melancholy or a sad feeling being described in the poem and yet a very bouncy rhythm with lots of end rhyme that again would be contrasting effects which we might want to think about does the punctuation in the poem and the length of the line help us to follow through on the thoughts and the events and the feelings being described? Or do we feel that there are gaps in the story? Are there some details about what's happening that the poet hasn't told us? Are there recurring images and symbols or metaphors? Are there clusters of words associated with similar things? Does the poem end with a conclusion? Do we feel that the poet has resolved what she was trying to say by the end of the poem. Do we feel that there has been a decision made or the story has reached its conclusion? This is not always the case. By our third reading then, we have a sense of what the text is like as a whole. We can say what it is about. We have a sense of its theme. And we have a sense of the mood it creates and the situation it talks about, the tone. And we can build up these images because we have looked at the techniques that the poet has used to create these themes and tones. We've observed the metre and rhyme, the metaphors and similes, and the use of adjectives and adverbs. So what we can now do is turn the observations we've made into an analysis of the poem, taking all of the notes we've made about the poem so far. The practical observations we've made function as the proofs for the broader response that we're going to make about the poem's meaning. So in a sense, we're turning our work around. We review the observations we've made and conclude something about the poem's broader themes and tone. We can then support the conclusions that we make by referring to the details that we've observed in our notes. In this way, we can demonstrate that the meaning of the poem that we're talking about is shaped by the choice of words, the choice of rhythm, the choice of rhyme that the poet has made, and that we have observed these carefully in our readings of the poem. Let's do an example. Francis Ledwich, A Soldier's Grave. Then in the lull of midnight, gentle arms lifted him slowly down the slopes of death, lest he should hear again the mad alarms of battle, dying moans and painful breath. And where the earth was soft for flowers we made, a grave for him, that he might better rest. So spring shall come and leave its sweet arrayed, and there the lark shall turn her dewy nest. Before our first reading, we can see that the title of this poem suggests it is a war poem. The poet may be unfamiliar to you. Francis Ledridge is an Irish poet who died in 1917. He was a soldier in the First World War. The lines are regular. There are two stanzas and there's the same number of lines in each stanza. There's no refrain and there are eight lines. So although it has a regular rhyme scheme and a regular number of lines, it's not a sonnet. Our first reading. We can look at practical elements of rhythm and rhyme. I count five stresses in this poem. Then in the lull of midnight, gentle arms lifted him slowly down the slopes of death lest he should hear again the mad alarms of battle, dying moans and painful breath. I hear this as a basically iambic rhythm, short, long, da dum There are five stresses, so this is pentameter. Five stresses per line is quite a long line for English poetry, and it's a line that's used for a lot of serious verse. Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, are in pentameter. So our poet has decided to use very traditional English line. The punctuation is quite regular. There are end stopped lines. There's no punctuation in the middle except in line four. There's one full stop at the end of stanza one. There's a full stop in the middle of stanza two. And there doesn't seem to be any punctuation at the end of the poem. The speaking voice of the poem uses the third person, we. But we only find this in the second stanza. 
and the we is only used once. So there isn't much emphasis on the narrator in this poem. Instead, the emphasis is on the subject, him, the soldier. But we're not given any personalised details about the soldier. We're not told his name, the place of death, which side he was on. And so although the soldier is the centre of the poem, all that matters is that he was a soldier and that he died in battle. We're told nothing else about him. Our second reading brings us to the details of language. Then in the lull of midnight, gentle arms lifted him slowly down the slopes of death, lest he should hear again the mad alarms of battle, dying moans and painful breath. And where the earth was soft for flowers we made, a grave for him that he might better rest. So spring shall come and leave its sweet arrayed, and there the lark shall turn her dewy nest. So the first line mentions midnight, the second line death, the fourth line mentions battle. So there's an emphasis on death in the first stanza. The seventh line mentions spring, and the eighth line mentions the lark and her nest, which also has a spring association. So the second stanza has a slightly different use of language. It emphasises the natural cycle of rebirth. The grave of the soldier is part of that cycle of rebirth. That's where the lark will build her nest. The adjectives are also interesting. The arms of midnight are said to be gentle, and they lift the soldier slowly into death. However, battle is said to have mad alarms and dying moans and painful breath. So there's a very definite contrast there. Stanza two, we're told the earth is soft and the grave will be sweetly arrayed for the lark's dewy nest. So again, the associations with death and the grave are sweet and soft compared to the madness and pain of battle. The verbs in the poem are all in the past tense until we reach the end, lines seven and eight, or in the future tense, when spring shall come. In our third reading, we look at the poem more generally and get a sense of its themes from what we've analysed so far. Then in the lull of midnight, gentle arms lifted him slowly down the slopes of death, lest he should hear again the mad alarms of battle, dying moans and painful breath. And where the earth was soft for flowers we made, a grave for him, that he might better rest, so spring shall come and leave its sweet arrayed, and there the lark shall turn her dewy nest. The overall effect of the poem, is it consistent? Is the use of language and the use of rhythm and the narrative and the use of narrator all of a piece? The long line in this poem, the five-beat line, and the regular rhythm do seem to be suitable for a serious subject like the death of a soldier. That sort of long line and regular rhythm is often used on elevated or serious subjects. But for a poem about a soldier, there is very little military language here. We only know that this is a soldier from lines three and four, which discuss the battle. The poem opens with death as a gentle figure, and the lull used in those lines contrasts with the mad alarms used in lines three and four. Lull is an interesting choice of words. It's related, of course, to the lullaby, a song used to help infants sleep, and it has associations of gentleness and care and love. Sleep is often used as an image of death, particularly in poems of consolation, when we want to make death seem less cruel, less painful. So lull here adds to the overall feeling that death is gentle and to be contrasted with the cruelty of battle. The ending of the poem is a little intriguing. The text that I have has no full stop at the end. This may be a mistake in the text, but there is a very definite punctuation mark at the end of stanza one. But stanza two, where we're talking about spring and renewal, there's a lack of punctuation. That may be something that the poet wants us to think about. Openings and closings are often points where poets make definite, emphatic points to the reader. So what general points can we make then from the proofs that we've gathered from our earlier readings? We can say that the theme of this poem is that the soldier's death is painful in a mad battle and the gentleness of the natural process of death emphasises this through contrast. The soldier's death is also final. Unlike the cyclical processes of the natural world, he will not return to life in spring. We see that in the contrasting language used in stanza one between the gentle arms of death and the mad alarms of battle, and in stanza two between the soldier's grave where the lark will nest and the soldier himself. 
The soldier's grave will be part of that spring renewal, but the soldier will not. The poet tells us nothing about the soldier, not even his name. He is completely gone. We could say that the tone is sad. This is a lament, but there is no language of anger. There is little sense of urgency here. Regular rhythm and rhyme gives us a sense of, of measure and poise rather than urgency. We might say that this is poignant or melancholy. The regularity of metre and rhyme also give it the quality of a song. And we would therefore use the term lyric to describe it. Lyric is often used of poems that have the quality of song or are musical. The second stanza's emphasis on spring is hopeful, but the lack of end punctuation, the lack of a full stop at the very end, makes us wonder if the story can end here. So our analysis of the poem could begin like this. Francis Ledridge's A Soldier's Grave uses natural or familiar or pastoral imagery to create a poignant tone for his lament. The poem has a regular rhythm and rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, with regular line lengths and end stop punctuation. This gives a lyric musical quality to the poem and also a predictable quality. This suits the language of the poem, which contrasts the predictable and cyclic forces of nature which are comforting with the unnatural, unpredictable and frightening forces of war. Here, death has gentle arms and the grave soft flowers, but battle brings mad alarms and painful breath. I hope you've enjoyed this poem and enjoyed exploring it with me. Thank you very much.